All right, welcome my Z Stars to a new video about testing a claim about a mean. And before we begin, I want to give a quick shout out to my students at Twinsburg High School. I love them all to death. Love all of you though. So here, this video is about testing a claim about a mean. If you've already learned about a significance test for a proportion, the awesome news is it's all the same. There's very couple um, things that are different, right? Well, the major thing that's different is symbols, right? For example, when you're working with proportions, you're making a claim about a proportion of a population and you're using a sample proportion to try to see if that claim is um, right or wrong. And when you're working with means, you're trying to make a claim about a population mean mu with the mean of a sample x bar. So that's kind of one of the only big changes is just symbols. So again, we're testing a claim about a mean. So you know, really what's this all about is that somebody makes a claim about a population mean. And we want to see if that claim is true or if we just don't have enough evidence to say it's true. And the only way to do that is to take a sample. So let's look at an example that we'll use throughout this um, video to help you understand the entire process. So a company that produces steel ingots, steel ingots are literally just bars of steel. They're just, you know, like a big bar of steel. And uh, they sell these to companies that want to melt it down and make something out of the steel. So anyway, they have traditionally always made their steel ingots 20 inches long. However, the plant manager is increasingly concerned that the machines might be producing the ingots too small. So his claim is that, oh man, maybe these ingots are smaller than 20 inches. Now that would be a major problem for people who are buying ingots off of us who think they're getting 20 inch ingots. So to test his thought, he takes a random sample of 10 ingots and the lengths of those ingots are below. So here are our lengths. Now, this is a sample. So the first thing you need to do on your own, which you could use your TI-84 calculator to do, is to get the mean of our sample. And the mean of this sample I went ahead and did it for you is 19.914. So we have to ask ourselves, are we seeing a mean lower than 20, because the mean really is lower than 20, or are we seeing a mean slightly low tw below 20 because you know what, it's just a sample. Samples are naturally going to sway a little higher, a little lower. Samples are naturally going to vary, and maybe that's all that's going on here. Now, the other thing that we will need from our calculators is S, the standard deviation of our sample. And again, if you use your calculator, that is 0 0.0743. And we're going to use both of these numbers a little bit later once we, got, once we dive into the problem. All right, so now that you understand the problem we're going to work with, let's actually dive into the steps. All right, now the best thing is, like I already kind of said to you guys, is that the four steps to do a significance test for a mean are the exact same four steps for a proportion. Step one is to create your hypotheses about the claim. Step two is to check your conditions that you need to build a model. Because remember, the idea is that a single sample, one sample mean all by its lonesome self, honestly tells us nothing. We need to compare that sample to a picture of all possible samples of that size. And that is, of course, called a sampling distribution. So you need to get those conditions checked so you can build a sampling distribution. Then we have to find our p-value. So the first thing we have to do is build that sampling distribution. Then we have to locate our particular value in that, um, in that model. We have to see if we have a significant sample or if we have just like a totally natural, normal sample. And then we have to find the p-value, or the actual probability of our sample happening, or more extreme. And we'll talk more about that when we get, dive into that step. And then the fourth thing you have to do is make a conclusion based on your p-value. So again, all of this should sound really familiar if you've already talked about proportions. All right, now let's dive into the hypothesis. The only thing that really changes here is the symbol. We're no longer talking about proportions p, we're now talking about mu's, the mean of a population. So you must have a null and an alternative hypothesis. H sub zeros are null, and H sub A is our alternative, pretty obvious there. And the null is what I call status quo. Nothing has changed. The, the machines are working fine, and the true mean is 20 inches, and the alternative is one of three options. In our case, the claim was that the manager thinks that it's less than 20 inches, so I use the less than sign. But in other problems, it could be a greater than sign, or you could even see a not equal to sign. And a not equal to sign means you don't really care if it's higher or lower, you just care that it's something different than you previously thought. So hypotheses are pretty easy. Let's move on to the conditions. All right, the conditions to build our sampling distribution are pretty straightforward. Um, we've talked about these conditions before. Um, they're not that difficult, we've used them plenty. Number one is the sample must be random to avoid bias. 
And number two is that the sample size must be less than 10% of the population to assume independence. And the third one is that you have to be big enough. Now, with proportions, big enough is when you have 10 or more successes, 10 or more failures. What does it take to be big enough with means? Well, there's actually three potential things that can happen here. You don't pick all three of these. You only got to pick one of them based on your problem. First, A, if the population is known to be normal, honestly, any sample size is big enough to build your sampling distribution just the way you want. However, if the population is unknown or like skewed left or skewed right, something non-normal, then we do need to be 30 or lower. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we do need to be 30 or larger. And again, central limit theorem is what allows us to do that. Central limit theorem says, hey, as long as our sample size is 30 or larger, it's okay to use this nice, beautiful model, you, even if your population is non-normal. And the third possibility is actually what's happening in our individual problem that we're looking at for this video, is that the population is A, unknown, and the sample size is less than 30. If this happens, you can still be big enough. Even though it doesn't sound like you are, you can be as long as you check your data and make sure there's no outliers or skewness. So you actually have to go back and graph your data, graph all of those 10 ingots, and make sure there's no major outliers or skewness. And I did do that on my own. I hope that you teachers have taught you how to do that, but you should be checking your data and confirming that there is no major outliers or skewness. And if there um, are any, then you would stop. But in this particular problem, a-okay, it looks good to go. All right, now let's move on to the work. The work is, in my opinion, the funnest part, or funnest, the most fun part. I'm very poor at English. So anyway, the work step starts with three steps. The first thing I do is build your model. So the first thing we gotta do is say, okay, a sampling distribution has a whole ton of X bars, a whole ton of them, tons and tons and tons of X bars. So what's the mean of all those X bars? That's the center of your sampling distribution. And if we're going to assume that the null is true, well, yes, some samples are going to be higher than 20, some samples may be more than 20, but if 20 really is the true mean, we should see 20 inches dead in the center. All right, next up, I need the standard deviation. The standard deviation, oh, I almost made a P there. That would have been a big mistake. The standard deviation for a sampling distribution for means is sigma divided by the square root of your sample size, N. And this is where we run into a huge problem because we do not know the standard deviation of the population. We only were told that ingots are supposed to be 20 inches long on average. We have no idea what the standard deviation of the population is. So that means we cannot use the standard deviation which means the normal model is also out. What? Well, if you've been paying attention over the course of my videos, you surely know how to fix this problem. First off, we're going to use the twin brother of standard deviation, known as the standard error of the sampling distribution. The only difference here is that we use S in place of sigma. Remember, S was the standard deviation of our sample divided by the square root of n. So it's the same formula, but it replaces sigma with S. Now, because of this, we can't use the normal model, so we have to use a T model. Well, no big deal. We all know what a T model is. It's just like a normal model, but it's a little bit more spread out and flatter. But for all intents and purposes, it's still symmetric. It's still mound-shaped, so it has a lot of similar characteristics with the normal model. But because we're using S right here, we got to use the T model. So now when we go ahead and find our actual sample, we got to locate our sample, we do need to use a T score. Now, the formula for a t-score is the exact same formula for a z-score. The only reason why we changed its name is because it's a t-model, not a normal model. Not really a big deal at all. And then we have to find the p-value, which is the probability of our sample mean occurring or more extreme. And all of this may sound a little fuzzy, but let's look at an example, and I think it'll make a lot of sense. So here was my example, right? The mean of all of our means should be 20. Again, we're assuming that the null is true, so I put 20 smack dab in the middle. Then I have my standard error. Again, boy, I wish I could use standard deviation, but since I don't know sigma, I'm going to replace it with S, the standard deviation of my sample, 0.0743, which remember I got from my calculator, divided by the square root of 10, and I get the standard error of my sampling distribution. Now, for the sake of a picture, I don't mind my students rounding that to 0.02. So up, up, up 0.02, down, down, down 0.02. Now I have to locate my sample. Remember, my sample was 19.914. And 
I can clearly tell, I'm going to use a different color here so this stands out, that this is a really low sample. 19.914 is somewhere way down here. So to be honest, the eye test, just looking with my eyes, I could clearly tell that this is a significantly low sample. So I kind of already know what my conclusion is going to be. But I do need to locate its exact position with a T-score. Again, same formula as a Z-score. I'm going to take my sample, 19.914. I'm going to subtract the supposed truth of 20. And I'm going to divide by the standard, oh, I wish I could say standard deviation, but I have to say standard error. I will say in years of grading tests and quizzes, the number one mistake I find is where kids will accidentally put S down here, the standard deviation of their sample. Do not do that. It needs to be standard error, which is the standard deviation of your sample divided by the square root of 10. So don't accidentally just use the 0.07 down there. We got to divide it by the square root of 10 to get standard error. And this gives me a very, very, very low T-score. So now I have two things that are telling me that this is pretty significant sample. One, my eyes, see how low it is. And two, that's a really low T-score. Now I need a p-value. A p-value is the probability of my sample occurring or more extreme. Now, since I'm already low, or more extreme means even lower. So I'm going to find the probability that a sample is even lower than mine. Now, here's another little hiccup. Typically, we find p-values with normal CDF. But normal CDF means you're normal. And remember, we're not normal. We're looking normal. Again, that picture pretty much looks normal to me. But that is technically a T model because I'm using standard error and not standard deviation. But this is actually not a big deal at all because on my calculator, I have TCDF. And it works exactly like normal CDF, but it uses T scores, which is what I'm working with in this problem. So because I'm going to go less than, I'm going to start way down at negative 99. Now I'm going to go to an upper value of my t-score, negative 3.6752. And the only other thing I have to type in here is the degrees of freedom. Remember that the t-models are defined based on how many degrees of freedom they have. It's a really easy formula. Degrees of freedom is simply your sample size minus 1. So I have 9 degrees of freedom. All right, once you get all that typed in, you're going to get your... Um, p-value, and again, that's how I got 0 0.0026. All right, so hopefully, like, you enjoyed that step. I think that's the, the most fun step to do, and I think it's really easy, and I think it ties it all together. Oh, let me go back here for one second. So again, do I have a significantly low sample? Yes. I see it, how low it is. The t-score confirms how low it is, and the p-value tells me how unlikely it is. Now remember, in the world of statistics, we don't really believe in unlikely samples happening. So when something like this does occur, I'm going to draw a bunch of arrows, like when something like this does occur, there can only be one explanation. There's only one thing that can explain this. There's only one thing that can make sense of such a low sample, and that would be if the truth is really lower than 20. Because if I were to pick this whole model up and move it down, then it would look something like this. And in that situation, my sample would no longer be weird. And that's the whole idea of why when something significant happens, it tells us that the alternative really is true. All right, so now let's go back and talk about <coughs> our conclusion here. All right, so remember, when you make a conclusion, you're looking for evidence to support the alternative. So the first option is your p-value is really, really small. It's well below your significance level. We typically use significance levels of 0.01 or 0.05. Well, in either case, 0.0026 is really low. So if that's the case, you will reject the null. We reject the null and state that there is evidence to support the alternative. If the p-value is above the level significant, that means your sample's pretty likely, assuming the null is true, then that basically tells us that we do not have enough evidence to um, accept the alternative, and we fail to reject the null. Keep in mind that we don't accept the null. We just say we do not have enough evidence to go with the alternative. But that's not what happened in our example. So here's what happened in our example. Since my p-value of 0 0.0026 is less than my significance level of 0.01, I will reject an all. This is significant. There is significant evidence that the mean length of the purport of the population of ingots is less than 20 inches. The factory should be shut down and the problem should be fixed before the customers find out and get all mad. So again, our sample came back at 19.914. That could have been for two reasons. 
One, hey, you know what? Samples vary. It just happens. Or two, no, our sample was so significantly low that we're going to conclude that the only possible explanation is that the true mean is lower than 20. And in that case, we should stop working. We should shut down the machines, fix them, buy new ones, do something, because that is a major problem. So hopefully this video makes sense. It, the whole idea of a confidence interval is so common sense. Some of the math might be a little bit tricky and you might need to take statistics to understand it, but the basic idea of what a significance test is should make complete sense to you. All right, guys, hope you liked the video. Hope it makes sense. Please keep subscribing to my channel. Please keep watching the videos. I really do appreciate it. Love you all and see you on the next video.